When people talk about continuous delivery, one of the ideas that sounds a bit weird is testing in production. If you take the words as they stand and imagine this to be the only form of testing that you need to do, this sounds and is completely irresponsible for most software systems. But there's more to it than that. Unless you are either completely irresponsible or work on a system that no one cares very much about, testing in production doesn't mean only testing in production. So what does it mean? What things can we learn from our system once it's out there? What is testing in production? And how does that fit into a broader testing strategy? Hi, I'm Dave Farley of Continuous Delivery. Welcome to my channel. And if you haven't been here before, please do hit subscribe. And if you enjoy the content, hit like as well. I'd like to begin by thanking our sponsors, Harness, Equal Experts, Octopus and Specflow. They're helping us to build our channel. So please help them in turn by checking out their links in the description below. If you'd like to learn about what kind of testing to do before you get to production and how to organize it, then my book, Continuous Delivery Pipelines, covers exactly that. It's now available on, as a paperback on Amazon, as well as on Lean Pub, so check out the links below. Testing in production is sometimes used by people who are skeptical about continuous delivery to show just how irresponsible this focus on continuously releasing software into production really is. I'm afraid though that the reverse is the truth. What we're really talking about is testing more, not testing less. There are some lessons that are best learned from production. There are some that we can only learn from production, and then there are some that we shouldn't wait for production to learn. There are times when our industry seems to operate only on sound bites, and this is one of those times. Testing in production does not mean only testing in production. It means learning valuable lessons from a production that we can't get from other forms of testing. For anyone who is a regular on this channel, you will know that I am obsessed with testing, spe specifically automated testing, as a way of learning if my software is fit and ready for release. I generally recommend a two-phase approach to automated testing. Commit tests, which are mostly TDD-style unit tests, written to validate that the code does what we as developers think it does. Supplemented then by acceptance tests, which validate everything else that we need to know to confirm that our software is indeed ready for release. We organise these tests in a deployment pipeline and then we can do what continuous delivery says we should be able to do. Release at any time that all of these tests pass, assuming that we want to. My preferred description of continuous delivery is working so that our software is always in a releasable state. Our deployment pipeline provides a definitive statement on that releasability. So within it, we're going to test everything that we can think of that defines releasable. But even that doesn't cover all that we'd like to know. In her excellent blog post, Testing in Production the Safe Way, Cindy Sridharan shows this diagram. I think it's a good model, though I disagree with it slightly. I'd move the boundaries a bit more like this. You can test these things in a test environment and in a continuous delivery context at least for more, for more consequential software. I think that you should. Nevertheless, I like the model and certainly once we get into production, I think that there are at least two different classes of tests that are interesting. Those that support your release strategy and those looking at the behavior of your products. So overall, my preferred approach breaks down rather like this into four rough stages. Two stages of things that test before we get there, followed by two to test once we are there. I draw a picture more like this. We start with what I call commit stage testing. It focuses on a technical evaluation of our work. It aims to answer the question, does the code do what I as a developer think it does? We're looking for fast feedback 
and we want to catch the vast majority of mistakes at this point. I generally recommend that you aim for feedback in under five minutes from your commit tests and aim to try and achieve about an 80% level of confidence that if all of these tests pass, then all of the other tests that follow it will pass too. Next, we want to confirm that our code is ready to release. I call these acceptance tests. These are the tests that confirm anything that we need to make the decision to release. Does the code do what our users want it to do? Is it configured correctly? Do all of the pieces work together? Is it deployable, scalable, secure, resilient, and so on? Now that we're at the point of release, what else do we need to know? Release supporting tests depend a lot on the nature of your release process. Perhaps the first and most obvious thing that we like to know at this point is, is the software up and running and ready for use? So some simple smoke tests or health checks of some kind that you can monitor to indicate that your system is ready for use once it's been deployed are a very good idea. If the consequences of releasing something wrong into production are serious for your system, then you may consider canary releasing as a good strategy. If you've never heard of canary releasing, the idea is to release changes first to low-risk groups of users or low-risk environments. And only once you're happy with your changes there do you release them to riskier ones. It's called canary releasing because in the old days, miners used to carry canary, canaries into coal mines. Canaries were more sensitive than people to gas, and so if the canary was sick or died, the miners knew that there was gas in the mine and so got a good warning. We did a form of canary releasing at the trading firm where I worked once. We categorised markets where our software traded as red, green or amber. Red markets were the most risky, highly volatile, lots of trading going on. Lots of money to be lost if we got something wrong. Amber markets were a bit less risky, and green markets were relatively safe, not a lot of trading, relatively low volumes, and so relatively low risk. So our release strategy was to do a canary release. We deploy our software first to a green market, monitor it for a day to see if our canary survived, and if not, we didn't let the change go any further. But if all looked good, then we'd deploy it to an amber market for another day. Still watching carefully before we felt confident enough to release it to a red market. A step beyond what we did for these trading systems is to automate the evaluation of the canaries. Create some kind of canary health check to confirm that all looks well and then automate the promotion of the canaries through the release process. Netflix do this at massive scale. They maintain what they call a canary index. Their auto-release process tracks daytime on the planet. Changes are then released first to time zones where it's the middle of the night. So if there is a problem, only insomniacs get to see it. The Canary Index is then monitored automatically, and the release is only allowed to progress if everything looks okay. There are other kinds of testing in production that we might consider at this point too, though. When we built our financial exchange at LMAX, it was written in Java. Java has runtime optimization as part of the, the environment and language. The JVM will analyze your code as it runs and optimize it to maximize its performance in the context that it learns from runtime. Our system was very high performance, and we didn't want to give traders who used it just after a release a bad experience. So we wrote some smoke tests that we ran at the point at which our change was deployed into production. The tests exercised the system so that the JVM optimization would kick in. So at the point of release, these tests exercised our software and warmed it up. So it was ready for use. These release time checks are things that we can't really do before release. So testing these things post-release is not only not about being careless and taking a low quality view of development, it's the reverse. We're testing everything that we can think of at the earliest point that we can to learn that lesson or to gain that value. Now we can focus on our products. Our software is out there. What else can we learn? 
Well, there's a lot of stuff. Is our software still working? Can it cope with demand? Do we have headroom for it to scale up or scale down if it needs to? Are we maxing out disk capacity or CPU usage? Are we responding to users in sensible amounts of time? Are there errors or warnings in our logs in production? These are some of the classic kinds of things that people have mon been monitoring in production for many years. Um, this is a form of testing too though. This technical kind of monitoring is important to doing and continuing to do a good job. We can do some testing before release for some of these things, but you'd still want to monitor them in production and learn those lessons. This brings us to other stuff that kind of verifies our, or corroborates some of our assumptions that we, that we made during our testing. Do the performance figures in production look like you expected? Do they match the predictions that your performance testing uh, made? If not, that's probably something important to learn about and to, uh, to adapt to. Does my security work? Did my security testing find all of the holes or are people finding others in production? Is my system scalable enough under load? Is it robust and continues to live, deliver value when there are problems? To take this to its logical conclusion, we can start to think about things like chaos engineering and chaos testing. Deliberately breaking parts of our system in production to confirm that it carries on delivering value. Again, we can certainly do some of this kind of testing pre-release. At LMAX, we had a suite of destructive tests. We'd run specific scenarios and then kill different parts of the system mid-scenario and then check to see that we hadn't lost any data. Or maybe that a failover had happened as we expected. But this tests the things that you expect to happen. What about the things that you don't expect? The most famous version of this form of in-production testing is probably Netflix again, with their simian army of chaos tests. Netflix have chaos monkeys that randomly break services in production, latency monkeys that randomly slow things down, security monkeys that look for holes in production and try to exploit them, and even the chaos gorilla that takes out whole Amazon availability zones. The idea is, if your software can survive this kind of stress, it can survive real outages as well as these artificial ones. Then there are the really interesting things to learn from our software in production. Do our users like our software? Or even, let's use information from our users to guide our product development. This gets us into the realm of using A-B testing, where we provide different versions of our software to different groups of users so that we can see what they really like or really dislike. We can go even further though, do our products make as much money as we hoped or reach as many people or help us to improve our reputation and so on and so on? These are lessons that are simply impossible to learn before we release these changes into production. This sort of product-centered testing is the best way to create great products. The data from software companies is often surprising. A few years ago, Microsoft looked at the success of software product ideas. They found that two thirds of ideas in software created zero or negative value for the company that created them. If two thirds of our ideas are bad, then what should we learn from this? Well, let's optimize to have lots of ideas and figure out how to identify the bad ones as quickly and as cheaply as possible. Testing in production allows us to do lots of things that we can't do anywhere else, and so is an important part of any complete testing strategy. But I think that this last idea is the most important one. By consciously focusing on testing our product ideas in production, we can guide our products to, better, to become better over time. We can treat the release of change into production as a series of tiny experiments that we can learn from incrementally evolving our systems step by step in the direction of products that people really love. Thank you for watching.